uh, study session. I'd like to now call the meeting to order. Let's go ahead and start with the roll call. Mayor Bagley. Here. Uh, Council Member Christensen. Here. Hidalgo Faring. Here. Martin. Here. Peck. Rodriguez. Here. Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, great. Let's say the pledge. I assume eventually I'll stop having to look around for the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Anybody on council have any? Okay. I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> you didn't even have council to member Hidalgo Faring. Let's rock it. What's up? So, um, I had been reflecting a lot on what um, council member Waters had um, said in regard to um, looking at preschool or um, any and the the rec center as far as having um, school. Um, school board or school district support and something that I would really like to direct staff to and see if it's it can um, gain some some traction as far as interest in our in our council to have a um, a board to council um, meeting so something like the legislative dinner where we were able to come together as two elected groups elected official group capacity and be able to discuss um, needs and priorities. So, yeah. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. So. And Harold, uh, Councilmember Lago Faring mentioned this to me. I think it's a great idea. Can we actually set up a time for? That's awesome. Good. Good job. Thank you. All right. Anything else? No. Okay. No, I'm done. I'm done. All right. Um, Councilmember Council Member Christensen. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Councilman um, Waters and I went to the Longmont Housing Authority today. And they expressed an interest, not maybe immediately because they're still, still gathering information, but uh, sometime soon in sitting down and discussing um, issues with the city and Longmont Housing Authority so that we could have a better relationship. I don't think this will be useful unless, I mean, I do think this will be very useful, but I also think it's essential that their investment board also sit down with us uh, so that we have all three bodies. So um, I would like to direct staff to explore that possibility uh, over the next few months. I think that's a good idea too. So can we do that too? Cool. All right. Tell us right back. Sing. Oh my gosh, I'm totally unhooked. But I can talk really loud. Yes, but I can <laughs> there we go. Okay. Now, it's going to pop in. It's not very long. So, first of all, I want to apologize for being late. I was so intrigued with this packet, I lost track of time. So, um, <laughs> uh, I would like to direct staff to uh, bring back our conversation uh, about who we're going to put on the LHA board. I don't think that we ever ratified that as a council. So we need to bring that back as to who, who we're going to put on the board I think of we LHA. Did. Well, I think we did ratify it. The third member. Right, I haven't appointed anybody. Oh, well, let's bring it back and appoint somebody so we can ratify it. But I don't want to appoint anybody yet. Oh, okay. We can vote. You guys can talk about it. I mean, we can put it on the agenda. I just don't want to. I mean, let's talk offline. Okay. But I don't. But we can we can talk offline. But they don't. Okay. Yeah. So, but the uh, and I was and I understand that we have to ratify. We have to do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Dr. Waters. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, this is not given directing to staff, but I'm going to do this. Maybe it's a point of personal privilege. Um, can you speak in your mic? Yeah, I just am, I'm mindful of the of the uh, feedback. Oh. Uh, but I'll do it now rather than later in the meeting. Uh, in our last, I think it was the last time we met, uh, I commented on a March 13th event uh, where the governor was going to be in town and with, with a round of breakfast with the focus on early childhood education, both his agenda and what we're doing. Uh, just late today, I get, we got an email, a number of us, uh, from his office that 
so there was a snafu in terms of scheduling in their office. They're now talking about the 27th of March, um, and I'm certain that's going to have to be confirmed, but that's the date they offered. So I, I know uh, invitations went out to a bunch of people today, uh, inviting them to an event on March 13th, trying to get ahead of this. So if anybody got an invitation, uh, they'll get a second invitation saying, whoops, um, uh, without finger pointing, just whoops, and then asking people to hold the date for the 27th, and hopefully we could secure the museum that date, um, which is the venue we were going to use on the 13th, just so and all, all the council members would be invited. And what what time will that be? It'll be a, uh, at least the, the initial uh, event was scheduled to, be, to start at 7.30 in the morning with a breakfast and run through 10 o'clock in the morning. I know it's a long stretch. Uh, but the governor comes at 9. There's a couple of things we wanted to do ahead of time, including sharing the, the um, uh, no small matter video. So Okay. I, I, there's a Platt Power, uh, Harold, there's a Platte River Power Authority board meeting that morning. So just something we have to talk about and just figure out how to coordinate this because I'd like to be at both. So, but the governor is probably more important. So, all right. Anybody else? All right, cool. Let's move on. All right, let's go. I don't have the public invite. All right, thank you. Cool beans. All right, let's move on to public invited to be heard. Uh, just a quick reminder, everybody gets three minutes. Three minutes, don't care if we love it, hate it. We're gonna have to shut you up. Um, but uh, please address the chair. Uh, if anyone's gonna yell, yell at me, I guess, is kind of the norm. So uh, let's go ahead and start with Scott Cunningham. If, uh, as people come up, if you could uh, state your name and address for the record, that'd be great. My name is Scott Cunningham. I live in Denver, 3771 South Narcissus Way, Denver, uh, 80237. And I'm, a, I'm an integrative physician here to address the kind of the 5G sort of thing. Can I start? You can, go okay. ahead. All right, well, greetings, uh, Mr. Mayor and esteemed uh, members of city council and other stakeholders from the community at large. Thank you for this opportunity to address the council. We are here to add to the ongoing discussion about the health effects of certain features of Longmont's excellent telecommunications infrastructure. And we hope to provide direction to the council to make decisions for this beautiful city based not only on expedience and appeal to popular demand, but also based on appeal to a robust scientific literature that, as you'll see, uh, demonstrates that wireless forms of telecommunication infrastructure are overtly harmful to any biological system ever tested. We want to start by applauding the city of Longmont for having the vision to put into place the most advanced fiber network uh, in the country, as I understand. In keeping with this overall vision for safe and highly efficient connectivity, we'd like to encourage the council to continue to expand on the excellent fiber optic system now in place using fiber optic devices rather than the more archaic wireless devices. Accordingly, as the blazing one gigabyte per second two-way download speed of, um, of your citywide fiber optic system is well known, we'd like to focus briefly on the particular disadvantages of, of wireless elements seen in older telecommunication systems. Before we jump into the scientific analysis of these technologies, we'd like to provide a Cliff Notes style description of elements of the wireless system under consideration in order to facilitate uh, unity in our understanding, um, uh, not only for city council members, but also for community stakeholders uh, in attendance this, this evening. A cell tower or, I should tell this to my patients, a cell tower or other wireless facility of any type is basically a two-way radio station for your cell phone with an important difference. And uh, the difference is cell towers, cell phones, and smart meters use microwaves 
to talk to each other. And yes, when we say microwaves, it's the same uh, two point, we were talking about this just, just before we started here, uh, the same 2.45 gigahertz radio frequency waveform used by the microwave oven on your kitchen counter. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Thank but you. thank you. We have your, this is your handout right here, right? The dangers of 5G? It is. We'll read through it. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Doe Kelly. I'm a lot shorter than he was. I'm doing part two of this, and my name is not Bill Kelly. It is Doe, as in Doe a deer, Kelly. Okay. Did you want my address? I'm in Longmontian. That I, I've never made anyone give their address. We just, oh, okay. I just ask for it, but oh, okay. you're a Longmontian. Welcome. I'm a Longmontian. Although I prefer Long Monster. Okay. So we were talking about the, <laughs> the 2.45 gigahertz radio frequency waveform used by the microwave oh, oven. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. It's a new system. Can you please start again? I'm sorry. Yeah, we're talking about, can I start? Yep. 2.45 gigahertz radio frequency waveform used by the microwave oven on your kitchen counter if you have one, which I don't. If you are surprised by this, please know that many people are not even aware of this. In fact, we felt it was important to provide credible documentation of this, which you will find on page two of this report here. So let's talk about the elephant in the room here. What do scientific studies say about the effects of microwaves on biological systems? It turns out the microwave radio frequency used by cell towers and other wireless devices, including wireless smart meters, has been scientifically demonstrated to cause numerous harmful effects to any biological system ever tested. And we have tens of thousands of studies. And by we, I'm saying science. It turns out the microwave radio frequency used by cell towers and other wireless devices, including wireless smart meters, has been scientifically demonstrated to cause numerous harmful effects to any biological system ever tested, and we have tens of thousands of studies, including a few that are mentioned here, uh, where researchers found DNA strand breaks in brain cells, loss of spatial memory, reduced cognitive function, alteration of several reproductive parameters, alterations in the elemental composition of teeth, and multiple pathologies in rat, kidney, and bladder tissue. Most of these studies, of course, are animal studies, since it would be unethical to subject humans, subject humans, to a technology that has never passed animal safety testing. Nonetheless, we do have some limited human observational population studies. At the bottom of the page is a review which demonstrated that eight of 10 Epidemiologic human studies reported increased prevalence of adverse neurobehavioral symptoms or cancer in populations living at distances less than 500 meters from cell towers. How many of us live less than 500 meters from cell towers? That means that you could live as far away as 500 meters from a cell tower, which is about a quarter of a mile, and you are still at risk for neurological symptoms or even cancer. And I have the neurological symptoms myself when Nextlight installed the new wireless in my living room, and I became electrosensitive. So now, before we go into more detail about particular wireless technologies, it's important to note that the various devices and facilities that utilize wireless connectivity, whether cell towers, cell phones, Wi-Fi routers, or wireless smart meters. All right, thank okay, you. Okay, he'll figure the next. All right, uh, looks like Ken Andrews. Mayor Bagley and uh, council members, my name is Ken Andrews. I live in Lafayette, but I spend a lot of time coming to Longmont, because why wouldn't you? So I'm going to continue on here. Um, this topic's really important to me. It's my wedding anniversary today, and I'm here. So it must be important. So just a word about 5G, which is shorthand for the fifth generation 
wireless telecommunications infrastructure. Turns out that 5G infrastructure utilizes two features that are fundamentally different from the current 4G infrastructure. First, whereas the 4G system utilized microwaves, 5G utilizes a specialized form of microwave called millimeter wave. It's difficult to find scientific studies of millimeter wave radiation, but we were able to locate a 1977 Russia review of seven studies that was apparently not made public until the CIA declassified it in 2012. The abstract reads in part, studies conducted in humans and animals revealed that millimeter waves cause changes in, body, in the body manifested in several alterations in the skin and internal organs, including myocardium, which is the heart, liver, kidneys, spleen, bone, marrow, lymphatic system, central and atomic nervous system, which is basically the brain and the spinal cord, adrenal cortex and thymus, so quite a bit. Second, using Longmont Civic Center as an example, the current 4G system in place utilizes a total of nine towers within a two-mile radius of this building, along with a total of 107 antenna locations per antennaresearch.com. The proposed 5G system requires small cell densification of transmission facilities, meaning placement much closer together, some authorities say as close as every second or third house, a much more conservative estimate suggests that carriers would be placing 165 new 5G small cells within a two-mile radius of this building. So in summary, the microwave radiation used by all wireless systems has been implicated in numerous scientific studies as an agent of harm to biologic biological systems. The 5G system proposed by the telecommunication companies, if deployed as wireless infrastructure, requires the use of millimeter wave radiation with a grotesque densification of small cell transmission facilities. In keeping with the community's overall vision for safe and highly efficient connectivity, we'd like to encourage the Council to expand on the excellent fiber optic network system now in place. I'll leave you with this. Next light is the best fiber optic system in the world. Now is the time for decision makers, makers in this forward-thinking city to make choices that keep Longmont on the cutting edge with the ultra-fast fiber optic connectivity, rather than hearkening back to the early era of slower and much more dangerous wireless facilities. If the Council sees the need for direction navigating into Longmont's bright future, we would suggest utilizing an internationally recognized authority on emerging safe high-performance connectivity, such as Colorado's own Dr. Tim Sheckley. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Maryland. It just says Maryland. Well, that's because my name is Mary Lynn, so oh, I apologize sorry, for poor Mary handwriting. Lynn. <laughs> Although I don't mind being called Maryland. No. Yes, yes. Um, I'm just here to underscore the fine presentation uh, created by Dr. Cunningham and to thank Longmont for, for being visionary in 5G and to ask City Council to please consider having a study session with non-industry experts, both legislative and in terms of health, who can get the Council up to speed on the work of activists, especially a core in Boulder County who are working to change the um, small cell regulations, which were recently shoved down everyone's throats by the um, FCC and to uh, get behind a movement to return various kinds of um, uh, home self-determination to communities when it comes to deciding whether or not to allow in some of this infrastructure and where it's cited. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I'm a long monster. All right. Uh, it looks like I want, I, Curtis, is it Ruzo? How's everybody doing this morning? I just have evening. <laughs> Sorry. And hey, listen, I can you get up the, can you pull that mic up so we can hear you? And my name is Curtis DeRuzzo. I'm 48. I've lived here in Longmont for probably about 20 years, if not a little less or a little bit more. I've had apartments here. Um, I work here. My doctors are here. Everything I know is here in this town. Everything has gotten so expensive that I cannot afford to pay rent. I live in my motor home on the side of the road. I never cause any problems. I've stayed in contact with Sandy and Tim Waters throughout maybe about the last eight months or so, and along my police department as well. 
Um, there's some good people out here that are living in their motorhomes on the side of the road. And we would just like to have a safe place to be able to park. I figured that if we were all together in one spot, that everybody would be able to be watched and everybody would have to follow the rules. Um, I do fine on my own. I've got my pride. I do not want to apply for housing. I do not use food stamps or LEAP or churches or anything like that. Everything that I do, I do on my own. I follow the rules. I go to the Boulder County Fairgrounds, do all my dumping. I've got all my tickets saved. Um, I've got cameras on the motorhome to help protect myself against some of the population. You know, um, I'm just saying, just give us a chance. Don't give up on us. You know, there's some really good people out here that really need this. And um, I'm taking full advantage of it. So, you know, it's, it's too late for me to, uh, you know, get a finance on a house or a $50,000 a year job, you know. So I just want to say thank you for letting me speak, and I hope that you guys will come up with this, a good solution for us. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Glenn Davis? Hi, I'm Glenn Davis. I'm from Longmont, and uh, like Kurt, I'm a full-time RVer, and uh, I have noticed some of the people that have used some of the parking lots in Longmont, such as Walmart, have left traces behind, and that the main thing that I want to put out there is that a lot of us are into no trace left behind and actually cleaning up and following the rules, and we're not trying to inconvenience anyone and we're just uh, an alternative lifestyle and I would appreciate any help that we could get for direction on where it would be legal for us to park. Thank you. Thank you. Evan Dunn? Evan? Okay. Julie Marshall? Good evening. No, I'm not a long monster, but I am a transplant. <laughs> Julie Marshall here. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Julie. Oh, that's all good. Yeah. The timer thing is a little bit it's, on the yeah, side. Is, no, it's, it's, go ahead. Um, I pride myself in being an American. I have been titled homeless for five years plus now. I've lived in an RV now, currently, also on the side of the road. Um, I do take responsibility of my dumping legally and safely. Um, I have also lived in a vehicle. I know what both gambits are. I have also lived on the streets. I did three weeks in Skidwell, LA, and another three weeks in Venice. Um, I've been in an island on New York. I have developed, I had developed lymphatic cancer by drinking the contaminated water coming out of Hoosick Falls up there. I moved back down here, and thankfully I have now cancer free. Um, however, I don't choose to pay rent. I don't choose to pay somebody else's mortgage, but I don't live off of social security disability. I struggle to find jobs where I can because I am handicapped. I have a lot of structural damage in my back. I have a mental capacity, but that mental capacity has a three month time span. Um, I've suffered from traumatic brain injuries. My handicapabilities are just that. They're abilities but I have those that limit me to being able to function in nor normal mainframe society. I get antsy with this. I sit in the back of the room because, you know, I get antsy. But I have done security, Pinkerton and Amsec security in California and Colorado, and I have been acknowledged by the White House. Um, I don't deserve this, and I've already been criminalized down in Colorado Springs because I was parking on the street, and they made it illegal. I am not a criminal. I'm an American citizen that deserves to have my own home, and that home is my choice, and that is a motor home. It is deemed a recreational vehicle, but it is not. I don't go out and have a good time with it. I live in it. It is my home, so I deem it a motor home. We do need a place to park. We need a larger place that we can self-marshal. We can keep an eye on each other and we can keep it safe. I'm 20 years sober and I have 35 years off of meth. Thank you very much. I won't touch the crap again. 
There are a lot of us out there that are like that. We are not criminals. We are not drug users and we're not drunks. We just want a peaceful and safe place to live. Your Safe Lot program could abide by that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. I'm going to slaughter this one. Darlene, and then could you just come up and tell me what your last name is? Not even going to try. Just call me Daro. Daro? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, I live in an RV too. I live in a 2013 Ford Majestic Pure White. And I bought it for $27,000. I've oh, been homeless. Hold on a second. You can start over. Oh, yeah. Great. I'm just, this, this, <laughs> this system, I can't see the clock, so I keep forgetting. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I, I bought it. I've been homeless for seven years. I've lived in the churches. I've lived in my van for four years. Three years ago, I bought this RV. Me and my three sons live in it, and uh, we house other people in it also. If they have a night overnight to stay, I can cook and clean. I work hard. I've driven the bus in this town for 31 years for homeless and helpless people. I'm a good person. Well, I think I'm good, but anyways. Uh, so, and I, uh, I, uh, I volunteer for the Recover Cafe, and I also sing in the Longmont Corral. <laughs> And our next uh, next next uh, performance is March fifteenth, and we're going to honor the veterans. So anyway, um, I I ain't got no place to go except my RV, and my sons have got no place to go. My son Rory, he went down to coordinate entry three years ago when they first opened it up. Where is he? He's sleeping in the back of my van. Why? because they never called him. They don't, they don't bother. They don't help him. He has two blown out knees. He has, he has uh, COPD. He also has, um, he also has mental problems. And just one week ago, one week ago, he's in a recovery program and, uh, and he's going to mental health. One week ago, mental health called him and said, well, we put you on a what do they call it, um, the list, lottery. We put you on a lottery list after three years. Three years, the lottery list. That's what they do. That's what it's like living out here. I've had to call David Kennedy because people blow their horns. They treat us mean and they have no respect for us at all. And we don't, you should go look at my motorhome. It's beautiful. You'd be proud to have that in your driveway, really. And um, so we just try to help other people out there, and I do quite a, quite a lot. I do quite a lot for the community. I think I'm an asset to the community, and uh, you'll miss me when I'm gone. So, yay for Via to. Uh, Thanks, Daryl. My job, yeah. Okay. God bless you all. Thank you. God bless Thank you. you. Yeah. All right, Clint Schreer. Share. Share. Gosh dang it, should have just said Clint. Typical der German thing, right. just like German vehicles and stuff, too many letters. So. Hi, my name is Clint Scher, I'm a long monitor, uh, 1633 South Vivian. I'm here as a representative of the uh, Heart of Longmont, 350 11th Street. Uh, speaking as... Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we should like get like a 10% increase in Right, you're not kidding. <laughs> Okay, I can't work the TV remote at home either, so, all right. But you got kids, right? That's true, they know how to do it. I'll, <laughs> I'll invite them next week. All right, go ahead. Um, just here from the Heart of Longmont speaking in support and as a supporter of the HOPE program and the Safe Lots. Um, over the last seven years, we've done a lot with HOPE, letting the homeless stay in our church, providing meals at Christmas, New Year's, uh, even providing overnight shelter for them. Uh, working with Joseph, we're, we're hoping to be one of the pilot lots as if this program goes forward um, so just wanted to let you know that we're here to support the program we look forward to, to working with hope and the city council and yourself mayor to make this program become viable thank you thank you sir see now i remember to stop it that was the last guy sorry 
Um, okay, that, uh, that goes ahead and concludes our uh, first call, public invite, actually our only call, public invited to be heard, because it's study session. Um, let's move on to, are we doing okay? It's only, we only, we're all right, right? Okay, let's move on to, um, is there, there's no special reports and presentations other than what's on the agenda, right? All right, so let's go ahead with 5A, revisions to electrical regulations. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. I'm David Hornbacher, the Executive Director of Longmont Power and Communications. And with me tonight is Carrie Spots. And Carrie is our meter supervisor. And she's going to provide a, uh, a short presentation and a brief overview of the proposed changes to the regulations governing electric service. These regulations, these proposed changes will be for City Council at the next regular council session. And before I get started, or before she gets started, uh, quite a few of the uh, power and communication staff, as well as other city staff, were involved in these revisions. And there are several here just sitting in the audience. I thought I'd recognize them before we get started. So over here, we have Jeremy. They aren't aware that I was gonna do this, so <laughs> you can see that they're thrilled. So we have uh, Jeremy Noteblum, Kate Medina, and Rocco Sapino. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Carrie. I'm a little bit shorter, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bagley, City Council members. As Dave stated, I'm Carrie Spots with Longmont Power and Communications, Meter Shop Supervisor. And I'm here to present the revisions to the city's regulations governing electric services here. Some of the items we'd like to discuss are metering, clearance, connections to service facilities, and definitions. On the electric metering and clearance, um, we are now offering a lever bypass type meter housing. In this type meter housing, oh, I thought I was going to have an arrow. So the top lugs inside that meter housing are the connections from the city facilities and you can see on the slide the lever with the red handle um, that is the actual lever bypass and this is a win-win for safety of electric personnel and it also um, gives the convenience of no power outage for the customer during any type of meter maintenance. So we would be able to engage the, the bypass lever, take the meter out of the socket and do any maintenance, checking you know, for any issues that may be happening there, um, plug the meter back in, re-engage the lever bypass and button it up all while the customer isn't inconvenienced with a power outage. Um, new phenolic badging makes it easier to read the address where um, we're standing. Um, this really helps it make it easier for nighttime outages. Um, a lot of times our personnel are called out to respond to an outage. We want to make sure that we're at the right location and looking at the right installation. The older brass badging was very difficult to read and as you know apartment buildings are maintenance they get painted um, a lot of times the the painting personnel wouldn't acknowledge the brass badge and they would paint over it which made it twice as difficult to try and read where are we <laughs> where are we so the phenolic badging is a really great thing helps us really identify where we're at Locating the equipment on the exterior of the building um, helps us to, to ensure access to the equipment that we're called out to. Also helps us with uh, future, ugh, <laughs> excuse me, troubleshooting for, for outages and streamlining and basically making making it to industry standard. Many utilities are requiring this so that they have the access and it's very easy to maintain and troubleshoot the equipment for the customer. 
new metering options for 400 amp services now have an installation like this a lot of customers now have electric vehicles the standard years ago used to just be a 200 amp service this type of convenience takes up less real estate on a customer's home or even on a business and the equipment's very accessible in this instance as well master metering considerations for multi-dwelling units we like having the contact with our individual customers being able to reach out to them talk with them in the public on some instances though um, such as a memory care facility or an, an assisted living facility it makes it harder for those individuals to maybe remember to pay their utility bill so master metering is an option for for those that get approval from our executive director of electric services electric metering and clearances clarifying the physical clearance requirements from the electrical equipment sometimes landscaping <laughs> gets in the way and this time of year it makes it kind of difficult when it's under snow or frozen under ice to be able to actually access the door for the utility pedestal whether it's plants fencing or other obstructions who was teasing that sweet little German he scared me to death <laughs> I, I was called out for um, a tripped breaker and a cut seal um, the customer had tried to flip their own breaker which is located in that electric pedestal there to the left and I noticed that the fence is blocking the face of the pedestal so I couldn't get the door off and then when I tried to enter the yard and knock on the door to let this customer know what I was there for, um, the dog came from around the back. <laughs> Good boy. Good boy. So, you know, we're just showing that, you know, landscaping can still be beautiful and still giving access to the electric equipment because our customers depend on us for that reliability of their electric service. connections to service facilities this is an electric transformer so this is um, owned by LPC and you can see they're kind of on the left where the paddles are with the four holes in the in the paddles there's limited connections that can be made in this type of cabinet so for apartment buildings they would need to a lot of times maybe purchase four or five of these transformers for just one of their buildings so one of the options is to allow them to install own and maintain a secondary cabinet like this the picture's a little dark but you can see there's lots of room for a lot of the wires and conductors then coming from the transformer into the secondary cabinet and then definitions we've updated you'll notice your red lined copies that you all received it takes a village to make these types of changes update things and really bring things into utility standards so some of the definitions that we changed were um, from general manager to executive director of electric services um, we used a lot of terminology like a CT because we were familiar with the term but maybe the regular public wasn't so a CT is a current transformer or a PT is a potential transformer in a lot of the code we talked about the developer or the owner or the customer and really streamlining that because a lot of these facilities you know from electric uh, from apartments go from a developer during the construction stage then they go into the owner of the apartment complex then they go into the customer or tenant who lives there but they're all our customer so really just streamlining all of that thank you for your time and consideration
No, thank you. First of all, I don't know how nervous. Did you get nervous? I'm very stuff? nervous. <laughs> you did great. Form and stubs. I mean, you took, I've never, you, you rarely speak at council meetings. You took seven minutes. The, the substance was perfect. We all understand it. It was brief. It was awesome. So thank you for your work. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much. No, great. Good job. Oh, yeah, sure. Council Member Peck. Council Member Peck. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. So I, I had some uh, questions uh, about your definitions, actually. And you mentioned uh, changing builder, developer to uh, customer, mm -hmm. everything to customer. So when I was going through the ordinance and reading and I, and I saw the red line stuff, there were a couple things that I uh, had questions. For example, in a multi-unit building that is under construction, mm -hmm. in the old ordinance is said developer or builder. But at the time when this is being implemented and put in the building, um, who is responsible for that if it is uh, not up to code, if it is not, you're just saying customer. And I'm wondering, is that going to leave our departments kind of wondering who, who's responsible for this? I mean, So a lot of times what that is is it's the customer of, of register, whoever's registered to pay the utility bill so if things aren't up to code and it's still in the construction phase mm -hmm. it would be the the developer okay because that was crossed out and that's why I thought it was I crossed out and yeah. we just yeah we stated that it's the customer because it's whoever the customer is of, of register whoever's registered to pay the utility bill okay um, and I did have another question um, on um, F2, page 12 of this, it talks about uh, the, f the franchise fee under electric. Can you tell me what that, I know you've said this before in the past, but tell me once more, what is the franchise fee for? Because I thought the definition of a franchise fee being marketing or selling your name or, so I don't understand what that fee is for that goes back into the general fund. Okay. Um, so Good question. And so um, when utilities provide service into different communities, um, whether it's electric or gas or water or some of those other services, it is common that they pay a franchise fee or a fee to that community, and that's for the use of the rights away or the other access points that they have in the community to deliver their service. And so the electric utility also why we're municipally owned, we're also a utility that has a right to provide electric service. And so no different than a lot of other um, uh, utility providers, we pay a franchise fee to the city for those rights. Okay, um, is this passed on to the, res the resident uh, through the electric bill? So that fee along with any other costs are just part of the rates. So it's just, it's embedded in the overall cost of service provided. Okay, um, and on the rates, uh, this isn't actually in your presentation, but it, for me it's a good time to bring it up. Um, I've noticed over the years that there is a city sales tax that is taxed onto the electric rate. Is that, why is that? What are we paying sales tax for when we're paying our electric rate? Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the official answer. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> Me too. Uh, electric service is taxable. And so, Jim, do you want to? Yeah. It's under the code, so it's electric service is taxable under the code. So, so um, that's still a little confusing to me because when we pay the rate for the electricity, are we not buying electricity from the city at that point? And why are we paying a tax on what we are? And are any other cities doing this? I haven't noticed why we have a sales tax in our electric bill. So for example, if... Jim Golden. Mayor Bagley, members of council, I'm Jim Golden, the chief financial officer. So I couldn't tell you about other cities off the top of my head. I could research that for that you and get great. back to yeah. you. 
but under our code, it's historically always been part of what is considered to be a taxable service. So it's identified in the city code. And so you're saying we're purchasing electricity. It's a sales tax on the sale of that electricity. Okay. And it would be great if you would research other cities in the county, at least, and, and let us know if anyone else is doing this. Sure. Thanks. Great. Okay. That's it for me. All right. Great. Councilmember Christensen? Yeah, you don't have to push Sorry. your button. It's on. <laughs> no, I just, my mind wandered. Um, so I think that all of these are very good oops, suggestions. Um, however, I am wondering uh, how much all this is going to cost the city and how much it's going to cost the homeowners. Do I, as a homeowner, have to pay for the lever bypass and for a new... Um, plastic engraving badging and for uh, new meter locations? Thank you for your question, Council Member Christensen. On the lever bypass, this is requirements for new construction. So as new construction is going up, then that would be one of the requirements to provide that um, or redo of a box. Yeah. yeah. Or, or or as a homeowner, if you're upgrading your yeah. service, yeah. then then yeah, we would okay. we would require the bypass. Okay. Um, and then your second question was on the engraving. Yeah. That is also strictly for commercial. Oh, okay. So anything where apartment complexes where there's gonna be several meters, several <laughs> units that you know they would need the main address for okay. um, the, the community or the, the apartment complex and then whatever the unit designation is. Okay, and is the, um, the location of the box, is that for new construction and uh, redevelop um, rehab? Yes, like that? yes okay. it is. It's not, so I don't necessarily have to do that. No. <laughs> okay, but it is a good idea. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, Rodriguez. Well, thank you, Mayor Bagley. So I guess to a certain extent, just to reiterate, outside of, of some upgrades to, say, the construction uh, issues as far as uh, the bypass, as well as for folks that are desiring upgrades to their, their, their boxes, uh, this will have no material significant, th this will have no material change to rates for our electric payers currently. It would be a one-time kind of deal if they did decide to get an upgrade to their box for, say, electric vehicle charging. You are correct that this would not have an effect on rates. And several of the things that we showed tonight actually are a direct cost savings to the customer installing those new services, and they would realize that cost savings directly. All right. That, that <laughs> You know, I think that's really at the essence of what I think people would really be concerned about when they hear about this, uh, this presentation is, will there be any material difference in their rates? And as the answer is no, I think that these are all great changes and uh, do a lot of good for the community as far as making sure that we have a great electric service, which I believe LPC provides. So thank you. Thank you. And now you really did a good job. Because you, you did a great presentation, then you took some, you took some heaters, and you did great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Oh, sorry, sorry. Step back up to the mic. <laughs> Round four, <laughs> Dr. Waters. People just don't get to ask. So uh, one is just an editorial remark, um, but I do have two questions for you. The editorial remark would be this: as we talk about costs and what gets passed along and rates and whatnot, I'm just curious if anybody saw the news last night and what's going on right now. In Fort Lauderdale, Florida. No, I didn't. Yeah, on NBC, they had the the lead story was the um, I don't know maybe a half a million tons of raw sewage that's been that's now because of because of infrastructure that has fallen apart is now flowing into the bay, going to cost billions of dollars to fix, and it's going to take years to fix waterways that people were were using for entertainment, for transportation. Are, are now all off limits because they're contaminated. And as they showed the, the, uh, the pipes that have now fallen apart, pulling out of the ground, I reflected on our conversation about water rates this last spring. 
and, um, and, and said to my wife, you understand all those concerns about increases in water rates, all of them were about infrastructure and maintaining the infrastructure this town needs so we never face that kind of a situation. The other editorial would, Mark would be, I'd be happy to pay for that bypass lever so, my, so I had 100% reliability in terms of energy flow, electric flow into my house. Now, question. Um, I, I lost where AMI metering shows up or fits into this. Did I, was it there and I missed it? This is, um, all of these changes are actually part of the AMI pro Progressing, yeah, toward that AMI. So these are steps towards that total deployment? Absolutely. All right, unrelated to the presentation, <laughs> but, but related to a comment I heard earlier. Um, I heard one, during public invited to be heard, someone referred to an installation that LPC did that placed um, a microwave something in somebody's living room and the effects that that resident was living with. Do you recall a comment, David? Um, yes, the comment that I heard was about the extension of next light so that fiber oh, to was that next house. Light, that's right. Yeah. And the only thing I can think of is they were referring to the a final install which they may do or next light might provide which is that wireless router that you have in your home to you know basically communicate with the next uh, the fiber into wireless which devices. Which would be a microwave? Uh, it, it's it is a it is um, it's similar to any of the routers that you might have yeah. in your house right now to give you that wireless connection and so I believe that's what they were well I, I, I did you're right it was okay it was next light not but that's under your broad jurisdiction that's all right, right. Mm -hmm. okay well I thank you I'd like to just not leave that hanging if that's right. an accurate comment that we heard so when you're a next light customer you have a choice of coming so the fiber actually comes into the ONT which takes the uh, the fiber optic system and puts it into a, a, a device that converts it into a cat 5 cable that you then run into you have a choice you can have your own router so for example I chose to get my own router which we did as well and which is a Wi-Fi router that that runs off of the 2.4 and the 5 yep. 4G and 5G that's what mine does you actually have the choice in Nextlight to get a joint ONT and router that does the Wi-Fi at the same time and I think that's what they were referring to in terms of Nextlight being able to do that do that and that is actually up to the individual customer in terms of how they do that. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you know if they're microwaves? Brian. No, I think it's microwaves. Oh, sorry, Councilman Martin. Uh, just as a follow-up to that, if a um, if a uh, customer, a next light customer chooses, they can also get a, an Ethernet router so that there are, is no Wi-Fi in their home. Correct. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anybody else? All right, now, final thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, let's move on to the first annual report on inclusionary housing. You still doing all right? Hasn't even been an hour. All right? Good evening, Mayor and Council, Kathy Fedler, Housing and Community Investment Manager, uh, Division Manager for the City. Um, and I will try and be succinct, but there's a lot of information here, so um, I'll go as quickly I won't, as I, I can. I won't yell at you. I get it. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so first, I'll start with the Inclusionary Housing Program snapshot um, over the past year. Um, there's about 20 projects under um, development. Um, that were our fall under the ordinance. So if you remember, the ordinance became effective at the very end of last year. And so the projects that just started did not have their final plat approvals <clears throat> prior to, um, or their preliminary, pl pre preliminary plat approvals prior to um, the effective date of the ordinance fall under the ordinance. So 
as you look at construction around the community there's many developments that are not under the ordinance and right now there's 20 in the development review process um, nine of those have already committed that they're providing their affordable housing units on site um, five are making a fee in lieu they've already decided that and eight are undecided and the nine the five and the eight add up to more than 20 um, because some of the developments are doing both fee and lieu and units or doing multiple um, types of units. So of the um, 10 total developments that are providing homes on site, five of them are rental projects and five of them are for sale um, projects. Of the rental projects, uh, there's a total of 789 units within the rental um, developments. 230 will have, um, there will be 230 affordable homes, and the majority of those affordable rental homes will be provided within the market rate rental development. Of the for sale um, projects, there's a total of 1,400 total for sale units within those projects. 52 affordable homes will be provided on site, and the majority of those affordable homes will be provided in partnership with nonprofits. <clears throat> for the fee and lieu um, projects that are saying that they would like to make the fee and lieu um, there's five total developments on that as well three rentals and two um, for sale developments at this point in time with 48,000 is the estimated amount we will not know the finals on these until we actually um, start seeing building permits um, and certificates of occupancy issued um, and then about 1.4 million is estimated under the two for sale um, developments. <clears throat> Those are anticipated to come in over a period of time. Um, we're anticipating about maybe just under 400,000 coming in in 2020. Again, those are paid at their fee and, uh, at their certificate of occupancy, so they usually come in at the end um, of a project. Um, and then about, I just kind of evenly split the, the rest of it um, between 2021 and 2022, looking at the developments and where they're at in the process and when they're likely to, to come in. Um, there has been some interest in middle tier um, building. Um, and I have to stress that again, these developments are still in the review process and have not yet committed to um, or signed an agreement committing to providing the middle tier homes to know what tier they want to fall under or if they're even going to do it. Um, but the two um, projects that are in process and have said that they're looking at doing that, um, one is at 1901 South Hover, um, and they um, indicated to Planning and Zoning Commission when they went before them that they'd provide about 209 units in the 101% to 110% um, middle or tier and a, uh, 27 in the 111 to 120 percent tier and then if you remember mountain brook um, satisfied some of their affordable units with the um, veterans community project and the habitat projects um, and they that covered some of their units but not all of them so there's still about 49 unsatisfied units that we're working through um, what that's going to look like so at some point those 49 units will either be provided under um, one of the tiers or they'll make the fee in lieu so we'll know as as we learn more we'll we'll let you know about that so looking at the current market market housing snapshot um, this indicates the um, changes in median sales prices over time and what you'll notice in um, 2019 is that prices are starting to level off at least in the median area and it actually is um, reflected in the average sales prices as well um, so there was a 1.3 percent increase in detached homes from 2018 to 2019 and a 0.74 percent decrease in attached homes um, some of this leveling may be due to more homes being available to purchase. There was a 5% increase in um, the number of units available um, from 2018 to 2019 in the detached home product and an 11% increase in the attached product. <coughs> New homes versus existing home sales. So um, again, looking at um, past years as well as um, the most recent current year, um, new homes are becoming a greater part of home sales, increasing from a low of 4% in 20, uh, 2010 to a high of almost 
29% in 2018, and then it uh, dropped a little bit in 2019 with new homes making up 22% um, of all home sales. The income needed to purchase or rent in Longmont um, is shown on this chart. Um, and you can see in 20, about 2012 is when a family at uh, making 80% of the area median income and at our city median income can no longer afford to purchase a detached home. Um, and then 2015 was when both the 80% um, area median income and our city median income wage earners could lo no longer afford um, the median cost of an attached home. And then the rent is the purple line, uh, the income needed to afford um, rents. And the dashed purple line is the 50% um, HUD median income um, for a two-person household. So that shows that it's been, as well, uh, quite a while since um, household, two-person households, one- and two-person households could afford our median rents. So this is new information. We just got it, so it was not included in, in your packet. This is from the draft consolidated plan, which is being put together right now, and they're still pulling a lot of information together. But this shows that our greatest rental housing need is for um, households and families at, um, that make at or less than 40% of the area median income. Um, inclusionary housing rental projects are providing, um, oh, and it says renal, sorry, instead of rental. <laughs> <laughs> projects are providing um, primarily 60% area median income units um, where um, if you look at the um, that area gap which is about the 50,000 to 75 no it's probably the 35 to 50 thousand dollar range there isn't really a need or there isn't a gap showing um, so we have a gap of 2,300 units. Right now we're looking at providing 230 units through inclusionary housing with, again, the bulk of them at 60% area median income. So there's a little bit of a, a disconnect there. Um, and quite frankly, um, for market rate development to be able to reach 40% and below without um, some greater subsidies than what we're currently providing just under the um, our affordable housing incentives is difficult. So trying to get some of those units through the um, affordable housing fund application process or CDBG funds, et cetera, is where we um, really need to focus efforts to get those, reach the, those units. So 2019 sales, this shows um, new and existing home sales. There were a total of um, 1,440 total home sales in 2019. Um, I want to say that we do need to still do a lot of scrubbing of this underlying data. This came from the Boulder County Assessor's website, and uh, my staff and I tried to do some of this and didn't get too far into it because it does take a lot of back and forth with looking at addresses and going to the website and um, looking at a lot of different information. But um, what we found was that some in the area that's below 80% um, AMI, and we assume also in that um, 81 to 100%, are related to investment buys and flips. Um, some of the lower sales prices turned out to be a deed or a trust transfer, um, so actually just paying a little bit in order to do that transfer of the deed from one person to another, um, and not actual sales. So. Um, we scrubbed quite a bit out of it, but um, not totally. Of the seven new sales that are below 80% that are showing there on the chart, um, four of those are the Blue Vista homes that are affordable, so starting to see some of that under the inclusionary housing program, um, and three are townhomes that are in non-inclusionary housing developments. Um, and then 2019 sales by type of home. Um, this shows that um, the majority are um, still single family, um, and um, single family homes in this case includes townhomes, but not condos. So it's a little bit different than how we normally talk about detached and attached. The assessor's office just does it differently, which is another area why, where if we have more time to scrub the data, we could pull those, that information out. 
So this just shows um, that all homes um, are at the very top, um, the lightest blue. Single family homes are the, the next line down and then the, the bottom line or the darkest color are our condo units. So for single family homes, um, 2019 sales, um, this just shows the difference um, in, by the area median income prices, sales prices. So about um, 93 homes were available um, in single family um, or townhomes um, at 80% of the area median income. Um, and you can see the different um, calculations there. So it's just trying to give you a breakdown of those sales prices affordable at the differing um, AMI levels. And then this just shows um, new home sales versus um, all, uh, exist all home sales for single family um, and townhomes. New homes, mm -hmm. new build? The new builds are, yes, are the blue. Okay. Yep. Um, the interesting thing here is that um, single family new homes are trending to higher priced units, unlike the existing market. Um, which still shows the majority of homes in the 81 to 100% AMI tier, um, which is that $300,000 to $430,000 price range. And also since single family um, in the single family category includes townhomes, that may be, that may be why that's skewing high um, in that particular AMI category. Just, just a quick question. Uh -huh. the, I know the definition of AMI but are we, this 81 to 100 on the previous, that one, mm -hmm. the 81 to 100, 101 to 120, and greater than 120, is that, um, is that based on their income or is that based on the house price? It's the house price that equates to that um, AMI range. And so we're not comparing that to the actual home buyer. We're Correct. just saying that home has that price it it's should affordable. generally be affordable to people Understood. in that income range. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Can I add, can we add just, just on that, and, and what, per, is it 30 or 30% of, of their income at that AMI for housing costs? Um, we use the 33% that Based we use for sale, board, our thanks. current sales prices. So it's all 33 yeah. across the board? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, then this just shows the breakdown of sales by condos um, for the condos for 2019 sales. Um, 13 homes uh, were available at 80% and below, and then um, the bulk of them at um, 81 to 100%. No, sorry, this one's the 101 to 120% AMI. And then again, showing uh, new home sales versus um, all home sales for condos. Um, and it's interesting that there, are, there were no condo sales that um, were affordable at or below the 80% figure. Okay, so looking at our affordable housing goal, how are we doing um, in our progress towards that? Um, we need to create about 200 new affordable homes annually while maintaining and preserving all existing affordable homes to meet the goal. And right now we're about 3,000 units short, um, which kind of ties right in with that 2,300 rental unit gap as well. Um, although we know we do need um, for sale housing as well as rental housing. Currently we're at 6.06% towards our goal or of our um, total housing stock is um, affordable. A little while ago we were at 6.2 percent but we didn't have a very large gain in 2019 of units created that got their certificates of occupancy versus the number of new total new home that were added to the city. <clears throat> On our pipeline of ex uh, affordable inclusionary homes that are coming up, um, this shows um, what we're anticipating. So 2018, we had 113 units that were produced, six units in 2019, um, with a little bit of issue with getting certificates of occupancy. And then projecting forward um, using estimated permits from planning and development, um, and then our um, estimated affordable housing units coming in through inclusionary um, housing. So since none of these estimates get us to our 200 um, per year, we also need to be looking at acquisition of market rate housing and converting it to affordable with subsidies or other um, 
new construction um, alternatives. <coughs> so metrics, uh, this doesn't look too good. Should have broken this slide up a little bit. Um, so what we're going to be looking at and tracking is changes in building permits and how those changes in our permits compare to state and or our surrounding communities. Um, changes in median home sale prices and rent prices and their impacts of that on the inclusionary housing goal. Does it need to change, stay the same? Impacts on our AMI t targets. Do we need to raise or lower those or um, adjust those at all? Um, and then um, providing information on what the market is providing. Um, how the units are being provided. So are we seeing a shift towards all on site, all fee and lieu, that kind of thing to report back on that. Um, and whether or not when we start getting fee and lieu, is that sufficient to replace units? Or what are we getting for the funding that, um, that's coming in? Um, we'll also be tracking obviously our 12% goal attainment. Um, and then who is being served with the, the program once we get things up and running around demographics and AMI levels, et cetera. So as noted in the council communication, some of the trends that we're noticing um, in a number of projects, um, both for sale and rental are choosing about the same proportion of making the fee and lieu to um, providing units. Um, we'll keep tracking that obviously and see if that, um, the eight units that are eight projects that haven't decided yet, how that works. Um, the rental affordable housing units are primarily being provided within the, the development. Um, and the greatest area of rental units needed below 50% and really below 40% area median income are um, well below what is actually being provided with 68% of the inclusionary housing rental units at 60% of the area median income. So for future um, upcoming uh, council sessions, uh, some of the things we're looking um, around code cleanup and code um, changes um, are looking at if somebody's doing renovations to existing housing um, and are creating new um, dwelling opportunities within that um, renovation, does the inclusionary housing apply to that? Um, other residential dwellings, um, if they are changing the type of dwelling uh, unit that they're providing, does that um, have inclusionary housing provide a change? All of these, these things that are here in, within this, um, these four bullets, insert bullets, um, are things that have come up because they need a site plan modification or something that triggers, otherwise would trigger inclusionary housing, um, but some of them just don't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, property line adjustments is another one. Um, and then changes to type of units. So if a development was planning on doing single family detached and wants to switch to townhomes and they're gonna provide more units, does that trigger something? Um, and then again, we've talked a little bit about um, whether or not we should uh, amend the code to allow direct donation of land to nonprofits as opposed to going through the city or um, alternatively coming back with a voluntary alternative agreement to allow them to do that directly. Finally, there's just some pictures of some of the things that are coming up or that are already under construction. And then um, uh, questions that you might have. So what didn't we cover that you wanted covered? What should we do differently? What was good information, et cetera? Do, do, I, I just, how many total homes are in Longmont? Uh, 34, 38, 38, 38 000, something. 38,000 homes? Of all kind of dwelling units, so thirty-eight. So you got thirty-eight thousand. So just all right. So we have thirty-eight thousand homes, and the median, the median price is four hundred forty-six thousand five ninety-eight. You said, and then so that means we have approximately sixteen point nine billion dollars of home value, more or less, right? Mm. More or less. It's the median, the median price. It means half of them are above, half of them are below. So, I mean, more or less. Works. Not, we can't get the average, yeah. right? But I mean, but I'm just saying we've got billions and billions of dollars. And so we're short, we need 5.92% of that to be affordable to 12%, right? 
to get to 5.9? Because that's 6.06 is where we're at. We need to be at 12. So 5.9% is different. So just to, I mean, just in my head, yeah, somewhere, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking we need to come, we need to yeah. purchase about a you billion dollars. Up. I mean, we got to figure out how to get about a billion dollar, about a billion dollars worth of property. And you, you might even argue about, well, no, no, it's too much. Let's just decrease it by half. That's still $500 million worth of property. So just to, just to I mean, and so I'm just pointing out, that's not, I mean, just a fact that the, the, as we talk about all this stuff, 125 homes of 3,058, it's just a drop in the bucket. So it's a pretty big problem, is my point. All right, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I wonder how Longmont is doing by comparison with the other municipalities in Boulder County who have adopted the same goal? Um, so, uh, Council Member Martin and um, Mayor Bagley and Council, um, I don't have that exact data. I can definitely get that and provide that. Um, I don't know that I'm sure some of the other communities do this level of analysis about their program and where they are meeting the goal. Others are just trying to get um, going and up to speed. So, um, we can definitely take a look at that. I think countywide we're at 5%. Um, so, including all the communities and, and their housing units. So. Thank you. It would be good to get updates yeah. on that. I can't tell with your finger. Are you? Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. And yeah. I'm going to ask what happened later, but I hope you're okay. <coughs> you what? Mood lighting at the Denver Art Museum. Mo the mood lighting? Yeah. Not good in the parking lot. Not good. <laughs> anyway. Dr. Waters? Is that mood lighting or mood no, mood, mood, mood lighting, I believe. <laughs> it was dark. It was dark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so on page three, slide number eight, six, the, the 1901 Hover project, is that the trail break project? Okay. There's uh, many, many names to that project. But, that, but that's <laughs> that, five. it's that one, yeah. yeah. Um, and have they gone, are they, where are they in the approval process? Uh, they're still in the whole um, thing. I don't know what level of, what number of review they're on. It usually takes three to four to get through. Yeah, yeah. So um, it hasn't been permitted yet. I think, no, 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 no. no. Right. Um, I think they're on their first and haven't submitted for their second. I think they, the update I had is they've submitted once, we've responded. They've gone to P&Z, submitted once, we've responded, and I think we're waiting on their second response. Okay. Now that could be second to third, but. Well, I'm pretty certain that there are some conditions for them as well as they go forward with this, but we'll get to those later in, a, in another meeting, I'm sure. Um, for whatever it's worth, uh, and it may not be worth anything, I keep asking questions about the Mountain Book Project, just like where are we with the IGA, and when, I know it doesn't come back till after the election, but what will their ballot questions be and those kinds of things. Uh, but I've also pressed the question that I asked you to press with them, and that is builder selection where are they with that and the in a builder that would deliver those 200 condos that they said would be market market rates at 80 well below 120 percent 120 percent and i'm told that they've selected that builder and they will deliver for whatever that's worth so that's at least encouraging that that would be that would add to that slide according to them 200 units but we'll see as they go through the process but i would just encourage that they would selected their builder and the builders says they can deliver what they said they can, what they promised to us. Or and if I can take this opportunity to answer some of the data questions, I know at the retreat there were some questions regarding who was in the hopper in terms of that middle, that mi middle tier piece. Um, generally, we don't drop them in until we get to that final yeah. component of building permits, so that we know for sure what they're doing. Yeah. Um, what we've been made aware of the gap on Mountain Brook, but then also on the trail break or the 1501 South Hover, um, they came in and said, we're gonna do it in the middle tier, but it was an actual addition of a document to the Planning and Zoning Commission that, that had the breakdown. And so we're refining our internal procedure so that we make sure that Kathy gets that when it's coming through the system. And so that's what was allowing us to do that. I know there are a lot of folks still talking about it, but they haven't officially given us yeah. anything that we can use at yeah. this point to put in this, but that's why you only see yeah, those see two it. numbers. Oh, first of all, I wanna say what a great job pulling together data. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love what, what you've done with this and, and what we can now track. 
And um, if there are two impressions for me, one is um, I think I'm the one that moved that we, that we set 60% as the criteria for eligibility for incentives. And it looks to me like that might be a mistake, that it might not be too soon to say, eh, we, we've tested that for a year, let's move it back to 50 because it's where it was based on the data that we're seeing right now. Would you, is that a fair observation? Yeah. That's kind of where I'm leaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that's, that's part of the reason we're monitoring and collecting the data. And I'm saying, I'll, I'll say, I think we ought to, I've had something, personally, I think we ought to bring back. It was probably, based on the data, a mistake or a learning opportunity mm -hmm. to move it to 60, number one. Number two, um, uh, if it's a, you had a question in here for whatever it's worth from my perspective, the answer is yes, to change needed direction uh, or needed to direct, should we change the <laughs> donation of land so it doesn't require council approval, right, directly to the, I would say the condition for me would be it needs to pass muster with you and your team. It, it, it has to be staff approved. But I, as, a, as we went through that discussion a week or two ago, whenever it was, with Dave Emerson and, you know, the, to, to add one more step in, in already a whole bunch of steps that didn't seem to add value for, that's a, I'm just one person, obviously, but that was my, my reaction. The, the last observation, and so I'm asking you to kind of to, to check this against yours, Kathy. Um, I, I appreciate what you've done with the above 120 percent, the 120 percent down to 80 percent AMI and then below, I mean, it, as you kind of break these data out. Um, so one of the things we've learned is that we ought to go back to the 50 percent, at least from my perspective. Another is that, that, that where we're making least progress right now is in market rate homes at 120 percent AMI and below. Right, that may or may not be permanently affordable. They're for sale products uh, that, that I would think of as attainable, right? That I, uh, if we were going to, you know, under the big banner of affordable, permanently affordable and attainable, at least that's the way it organizes in my head, and we can debate that. But, the, the, but we're not making the progress on attainable housing that we need, that needs to be in the marketplace for City of Longmont employees who would like to live in the town where they serve, or school district employees who would like to live in the town, if, assuming they would like to live in Longmont, because it's bigger there, school district's bigger than, bigger than Longmont, but my point is for working families. We're still way behind the curve on that part of the continuum. Is that a fair observation here? I think it is at this point, and I think it is um, allowing the developments some time to understand what does that mean? What are their price points? I mean, it does take them a while to get through the development review process and figure out what their financing is, et cetera, um, it's before a key part of it. they could commit to yeah. a specific target tier. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's probably going to be some that come out of it. Um, it's just it's a little bit early still. Murky. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Nice job with the report. Thank you, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, and I want to echo what Council Member uh, Waters said about the 50%. I think we do need to lower that if going forward. Um, and Kathy, I want to talk about the bullet points that you made uh, for possible code changes. Um, so we can just go through those one at a time. Um, the first one about giving credit for existing houses, could you explain to me the uh, the difference between a home that is being torn down or homes that remain in service. Um, are we talking about raising a house or perhaps um, building something new that would be affordable or get credit for? I'm sorry. Let me get to that. Oh, there it goes. Oops. All right, so I am very sorry. I no, was that's okay. Let me read this. it so that <laughs> everybody knows what I'm talking about. The first one says, credit for existing houses should be given in the calculation for the number of AH units that are required. 
should this be applied to a home that is torn down or just to homes that remain in service? Can you explain that to me, what you mean exactly? Yeah. So um, we have had situations where uh, development, they're redeveloping a property okay. and they've torn, so that 710 Martin is, is an example. Oh, okay. They tore down one home um, and are, in order to build additional units, one they left on site and are reno renovating. So should they get credit for the home that was torn down um, as a unit if they're replacing I guess you could say they're replacing it with one unit, so then how, how does that get applied? So obviously the, the, the one they're renovating doesn't have an inclusionary housing. It shouldn't have the inclusionary housing applied to it. I think that code's pretty clear on that. But the one that's torn down, how do we in, include it or not in the remaining units, uh, the other units that they're building? Do they get a credit for it or not? So if they build 10 units, mm -hmm. they tore down one, they build 10, do we apply it to nine or do we apply it to all 10? I would say we apply it to all 10. That's just one, one And we opinion. don't have to decide these okay. tonight. Sure. We'll be, bring back examples and <clears throat> okay. options perhaps. All right, great. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I just wanted to speak briefly to um, some of the data sets concerning median pricing of housing in, in Longmont. Uh, as, as some folks know, uh, hopefully most folks know, I work in the real estate industry as a real estate appraiser, I'm not a broker. So I, I look at market trends on a daily basis at more of a micro level, I would put it, where I'm looking at specific market segments. Um, and as such, when we look at the median housing prices, in long run, yes, I would say they are stabilizing in general. But as far as uh, what I would call kind of the entry level housing, which would be on the lower portion of our middle tier, the 81 to 100% uh, AMI category, I would say we're still very much squeezed as a market segment. We're st still seeing very high levels of competition and, and uh, increasing values above and beyond the, the percentages that were, were cited as far as housing prices increases in, in the city of Longmont. Uh, we're seeing, you know, 15, 20 offers uh, above listing price on some of these properties. And I will admit that, generally speaking, these properties are existing homes, uh, older homes, uh, not generally new construction homes. Uh, the new construction homes, there's not a lot of negotiation leeway when you're when you're dealing with contracting, uh, but when you're you're dealing with uh, an on the market property, uh, we're seeing an extreme amount of competition, uh, specifically in the 81 to 100 uh, percent market segment, which is driving a little bit above. You know, it's driving the prices of those properties a little bit above. But once you get over 120 percent, yes, we're seeing stabilization. Um, and as such, it's tough to, to not see a lot of increase in inventory because of, of our policies in this specific segment because we're not really relieving that pressure. And that's one thing I hope that we can find some way that we can, I mean, obviously, um, I think we are at a point where we understand that building detached housing at that m market rate is not really feasible. So definitely uh, incentivizing more condominium and townhome and attached homes is the only way to really hit that market segment to alleviate that, that, that pressure point. But uh, we're still seeing, uh, I would put it still up at that 9, 10% range, e as, and at, even at an earlier point in the year that we're used to, because I mean, this is still mid-February and we're starting to see the kind of bidding wars that we don't normally see probably for a month or two uh, traditionally in this market. And I just wanted to make those comments as we consider any po sort of policy changes as we go forward. Thank you. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I just wanted to add to that that I am starting to receive comments from residents, mostly renters, 
and they're saying, what are you doing building single family attached homes in Longmont? So it might be an encouraging data point that the attitudes of the populace are changing a bit around that too and are expecting denser uh, housing stock. And I've, I had a couple comments uh, from people who are talking about the, the solution that the market's going towards is people sharing homes, meaning getting roommates. And I'm not saying that that's appropriate or inappropriate, it's just that multiple families are living in single family dwelling units. So anyway, well, thank you very much. We appreciate that presentation and update. Sure. Thank you. All right. All right. It's been an hour and a half. Do you mind if we take a five minute break? Yes. And then we'll come back and handle our final item of safe lots.
Dank. Here. That's cold. Sorry. I know what you drink, Mr. Weaver. All right, let's go ahead and ask the city staff to present the Safe Lot Research presentation. And council members, uh, thank you for letting us. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to uh, give you a, a couple of caveats first. I mean, one is um, this is really a team effort, and I have my team nearby, uh, Chief Satter. Uh, Joseph, uh, Joni, and myself are what make up the the, the research piece of the of the task force, and I'll go over who the whole task force is. So, if you have questions that I cannot answer, I will be phoning a friend uh, and asking them to come up and try and provide the best answer possible. The other caveat that I want to give is this is this is a progress report; it is not a final report. Um, we are still researching and, and looking into different models. This is happening here in Longmont um, and other places. And, um, and one of the takeaways that we may leave here tonight is direction from you on what other things that you want to know or other questions you want answered that we may have not answered in this progress report. So, you know, it's just a caveat that we are in we are in this is a work in progress and we, we hope to get more and more information to give you all uh, what you need to make an informed decision on behalf of our community okay with those caveats said uh, I will jump in it's a short slide it's 13 slides you received our report and I will go um, through this and then we will open it up for discussion and questions um, so really this this the background is this really started uh, and came out of our Council conversations on homelessness. Uh, we've had three. We had three in, in uh, 2019 where we presented some data around what we know around who is experiencing homelessness. And in our September uh, council conversation, Joseph brought up the idea of a safe lot, and council then mandated or tasked staff to create a task force to do some research into the safe lot model or safe parking I will also it's also known as safe parking if you ever just want to google it is there there is more and more stuff being written about it so this is the the whole task force uh Joni Marsh Jeff Satter Joseph Sadovich myself Amy Scriver Mike Butler uh, Jared uh, Van Dellingham uh Karen Roney and and Harold Dominguez is on the task force um, we quickly met and decided that we were going to try and divide and conquer some of the questions that council had around what is the most viable model, who's experiencing it, and there's a question of, of, of return investment. So what do we know about what type of systems capacity, housing system kind we have that investing in this model, what, what kind of return on investment will we get versus investing in more housing or uh, bridge housing? So we broke up those three uh, into those three teams of the task force. Um, and we very quickly decided to decide we needed a purpose. And our purpose as a task force is really to understand what are the current gaps in the countywide systems to move people out of homelessness and into stable housing and to explore what are some temporary options that we have to address those gaps while HSBC works on bringing new housing resources. As you know, uh, council approved some new housing resources in the 2020 budget, which we're very grateful for, and we are working on getting those online. <laughs> However, in the meantime, there are still gaps, and how can we address those gaps? And really, the safe lot option is one of many options that we can look at that may serve as bridge housing to try and get people to that final uh, goal of being housed. Uh, so again, these are the three teams that we created, the research team, uh, the data team, and the capacity team, the system capacity team. Um, this, the research team did a lot of work on best practice research, and there is quite a, a spectrum when it comes to safe parking models throughout the country, primarily there in the west, uh, northwest in California. But there, even though there is a, quite the spectrum of different models of how they work, some are bigger, some are smaller, uh, some uh, serve RVs, some serve cars. There are some general best practices that are found in all of them, uh, for, the, for the most part. One is most, if not all, have case management that leads to a stable housing situation. 
So the idea is how do we get people housed? All of them provide overnight parking and some provide more, very few provide more than that. Uh, most pr programs at this point don't allow RVs and we'll go into that question in a second. Uh, it's primarily a cost issue. Um, and they all provide some kind of access to restroom facilities and they most of them provide some kind of security. And, and that can be done in, in a spectrum of ways as well. I've seen everything from you know, private security guards, firms to volunteer security and that, that of course affects cost. Um, but those are kind of the, 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 what you see in the models throughout the, the country. Those are the things that they tend to have. Um, this essential elements uh, piece I added because I read this very interesting study done by the University of Seattle's law school. And they were looking at... I'm going I'm to cut you off. I need to go. Okay. So I've got, it, my, I've got a family member that just went to the hospital that oh, cool. I need to go. Sorry. So Mayor Pro Tem's in charge. So I apologize. No I'll worries. call you after to get filled yeah. in. Okay? Thanks. Yes. And I hope your family member is, is doing well. So this study looked at what are the essential elements of successful programs uh, throughout the country. And they really came down to three key things and being very intentional about them. Uh, I'm going to quickly cover the first two, but then I'm going to focus a lot on the third one. Um, one is funding sources. You know, the, the, the study looked at three case studies, and each of those case studies, the, they were funded in different ways. Some were funded by primarily private donors, some were funded by government, and funding um, and connections to funding can also lead to different uh, limitations on how the program m works. So for example, when you get government funding, there's a lot of government strings attached to it. Whereas when you get private donor funding, it may not be as um, stable as government funding, but it, it, it may open up different avenues of how you deliver the services. Uh, then the second one is key relationships. It, each of those successful models had developed key relationship with both uh, municipal staff and in particular with the police department. The most successful ones had very strong relationships with local police departments. The final one, reputational capital, I thought was very important. That one focuses on wherever a model is held, needs to have that reputational capital with the, the neighborhoods where they are located. Uh, there needs to be strong community engagement uh, and strong community voice in how that model is delivered. Uh, those three things together really pro are is the fundamental basics of making successful models. Uh, we know that. Uh, that's what that study showed. So, and Joseph is here so he can talk more about his but hopes Part of our research team was also to get information from HOPE on their safe lot pilot. Now as a reminder, this pilot is being done by HOPE without any formal city resources or vetting by the HSBC system at this point. Uh, and I want to correct because Joseph uh, graciously uh, corrected me on my report and it was also in the paper. Um, in the report it talks about um, Joseph or uh, the safe lot pilot using navigation um, as kind of its basis for intake. Uh, because this is not funded by the city or the county, Joseph uh, let us know that HOPE will be using its own um, intake process. And again, this is a work in process. We're still trying to figure out what that's going to mean for how do we help people access some of the resources that is within the HPC system. Okay, but I just wanted to point out that correction. Um, but the safe lot provides temporary par parking waiting for housing. It will provide case management and it will add background checks, something that doesn't happen right now. Uh, people living in vehicles, not RVs, primarily like I said, cost is an issue um, and who are not accessing the, the shelter. And, it's seek and HOPE is seeking to implement two lots, one for adult individuals and then families, uh, a separate lot for families with children. Uh, with a total of five to seven vehicles per lot. I, I think the idea is to be manageable at first, to learn from it, and then decide how to move forward. So here's some of the costs that, uh, we, that, that we researched, and Joni, was, Joni Marsh was extremely helpful in um, finding these costs. 
This is what it would cost if we were to provide our own RV safe lot. Uh, so we would need connections uh, and a dump station that we'd have to create, and that would be from 38,000 to 76,000. We would need, of course, development. Uh, we would need street improvements to make sure that it's a feasible uh, place to park those RVs. Uh, and those are the ranges. And these, these are estimates. These are ranges that, that Joni uh, researched. And then if we were to provide a restroom facility, this is the estimated cost. Uh, so it's quite an investment to make. Um, of course, vehicles, and these are, these are the estimates provided by Joseph, are much lower. Um, primarily, it's focused on security uh, and what they would provide. Um, there is a one time if we go, if Hope decides to go with a shower restroom trailer, there is a one time fee of 30,000, but we're not exactly sure what it would, the maintenance would be on that option. Or to save some costs, Hope could uh, choose to do uh, portable restrooms. And according to Joseph, it's around $4,000 a year to rent and maintain those um, restrooms. So that is the research team's work, what we're doing. The Safe Lot Data team, that team uh, is working on trying to find more and more what is the need. And so with the help of Amy Scriber and our GIS folks, we created a survey uh, that is primarily being used by public safety right now. And this is just a snapshot. So this data has not been completely analyzed yet, but I did want to show council here's the progress that we're making on, on collecting better data. So this is a survey that uh, public safety has uh, on their phones that is helping us capture uh, data around those who are experiencing homelessness that are living in cars and RV. Um, as you can see, the number of folks in cars is much less than what uh, people that are living in RVs, and you can see the number between operating RVs and non-operating RVs and car um, operating and not operating. Um, that those are the numbers that are that are are coming and we hope to have a much better picture uh, by the end of March. Uh, that that right now is our goal to to finish data collection so that we can come back and present some information uh, to council. But I just wanted to give you a snap to sh snapshot so you can see what we're doing and but it does more than just capture that it also looks at who you know what is their family makeup um and these are all voluntary questions and contacts um they don't have to answer so we have the unknown uh you can see that the majority tend to be single even though there are some couples and there is there was one at, at least at this point there was one family with children um and you can also see you know the vehicle if when, once you click vehicle, it breaks down from vehicle to art to that other s picture of RV non-operating and operating and, and car operating and not operating. But the majority of the, of the contacts, uh, 72 so far, um, have been in vehicles, either cars or RVs. So we are collecting this data to try and frame a better picture of who's experiencing it and what we're seeing out there. Uh, and I think this is being very helpful to us to, to give us a better understanding of, uh, of the people that are experiencing homelessness living in RVs and cars. So what is our next steps? Well, as I mentioned, we continue to gather data via survey until the end of March. Uh, we are working on assistance capacity analysis. So the housing exits team that's part of HSBC is doing a portfolio uh, of available housing and that was in the report you can see part of the work that they've done so far and hopefully we'll have more and then you know come back to council for further direction uh, but I think this is a great opportunity tonight to to get some further direction from council to try and find out what are other questions you may have or other things you may want to uh, us to research council member mark thank you mayor pro tem um, my question has to do with uh, people in shelters. I know you were counting contacts there on that slide, or mm -hmm. that was my understanding, but I also know that we have up to 30-ish people a night mm -hmm. in our shelters, so how did you end up with no contacts? So currently, the only people who have the, the, the and that's a great question, and, and 
Currently, the only people who are using the uh, app are city staff. So city staff may not be, they, they, so these are folks, are, these are police officers that are on the street. And so they may not be going to the shelter to have those contacts. Um, so that's why there's no contacts at the shelter because these are happening on the street as city, the city uh, police patrol or get calls. Okay, so they're not running, that maybe they know the people that are on the shelter, using the shelter, so they don't talk to them, but because the people using the shelter are on the streets most of the time, aren't they? Uh, they are, and there were some in the shelter, but again, I think it's primarily those that are getting called, um, that, are, that are things, that are vehicles that are being, getting calls on vehicles on the street. I understand, okay, thank you. <laughs> He's not getting any can sound. Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. <laughs> so I think part of this is, and we talked about this before, this is an evolution on this program. And so right now it is just with the police department. But where we want to be, um, let me back up a little bit. There's some unique things to this that helps us get a cleaner data picture. Right. So one is the address auto populates or you can um, versus having people manually input the address and you get so many different addresses that you can't bring those together. So that, that happens automatically in, in this app. The other point is, is it's connected geospatially. So then that goes in with our GIS system too, so that we can see other things in connection to this. Now, the key point is, is they're still working some kinks out, so they just have it with the police department at this point. What we eventually want to do is actually get this app into all of our partners. And so I know I was in the data meeting with Joseph and said, I would like you all to have this as well as whomever it is that's interacting with the population, they have the ability to do this. And then there's, we have to then be able to put boundaries around who can input put what, who can see it. And those are things we're still in the process of doing. So at full implementation, I would like to see a lot of people with access to this so that we can then get that broader picture. And at that point, we would not have apparent gaps that were puzzling the way I was puzzled about no shelter people. We hope, but again, it's it, 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 this is um, information that they give to us. And so how individuals answer that could show itself in the data. Um, but we are starting to see things um, as, as they move through with this. But we'll know more hopefully by the end of March. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and so ultimately, again, so it really, like, like to reiterate what Charles said, we do want to get it into the hands of our outreach folks like Andy and our new outreach person from um, the Boulder Shelter doing a diversion. So the idea, we're just working out our kinks so that we can get it out to the community to be more effective in capturing the gaps, as you just said. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilmember Christensen. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Alberto, I, I, think, um, I think this is a very worthwhile program to do a pilot on. I, uh, we had a lot of people from, uh, who are living in RVs come and talk. And um, I understand from this study why it's a better idea to do a pilot program on people living in just in cars because it's more cost efficient and there are less people and all that. I do hope though that we can find a way to expand this to RVs because it's a problem for those people first of all and <laughs> it's a problem for everybody else too. And um, you know, I. I I just hope we can move forward with it. I think it's, uh, this is a terrific way to start. Thank well, we, you. We, we can definitely continue the research. Again, this is just initial research. Uh, there is much more research that can be done. Right. Uh, and we can look at different models that include RVs as well. So we, we can, right. I, this is what, the, yeah. yeah and so if I we appreciate can, your comments. And if we can prove it out this way, then we can expand it to something more like, well, for RVs and things like that. So. Okay. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I do want to make a clarification now, and if I if I'm mm -hmm. interpreting this incorrectly, correct me. Mm -hmm. That our when we uh, go to an RV safe lot, it is not a permanent safe lot. It is not for people to 
live there permanently. It is a temporary right. safe lot, and they must be in our coordinated entry system because with Boulder County, our whole focus is to get people into stabilized housing. And so the people who are living in RVs who will be in the safe lots are in RVs temporarily while they work out of that living situation. That, that is the same understanding that I have, that this is a temporary solution to get people into housing. Correct. Thank you. And I think that's one of the questions that we've talked about that we may need to add is to say, if this, then this, to right. get at that very question, because that's another level of breakdown in the data that will be able to inform council. You have 30, and of the 30, 25 want it permanent, then that's a different conversation exactly. based yeah. on what you asked. And that was something that mm -hmm. we need to figure out how to put in. Councilmember Hidalgo Ferry. Um, so um, I guess in looking at funding, because one of the things, and when I've spoken with individuals um, living in their RVs, it, uh, I, I see, it seems like I'm talking, running into more folks who are in RVs as opposed to vehicles. Um, what, have you done any research on safe lots where they do have the capacity to hold RVs? Um, how, how do they attain funding and how do they keep their program going? So I have seen some models that have RVs. Uh -huh. uh, and again, this is, we, we do more research. Um, what, one of the ones that is happening in San Diego, uh -huh. um, uh, Dreams for Change, uh -huh. they have an RV lot. But what they do, and I, and I can look more into their funding, but the way that their RV lot works is they did not provide a dumping station or <laughs> any other of those kinds of amenities. Mm -hmm. And they lock it up. But when, when morning comes, the RVs need to leave the lot mm -hmm. and go to a certified dumping station and dump, th dump there, mm -hmm. uh, and then they may return. Uh, but that would mean that their RV has to be in good running condition and be able to do that and that they can find and access a place where they can dump. So that's mm -hmm. one model I've seen, but again, mm -hmm. I think more research is needed and I need to work on that. Mm -hmm. So then it could be coordinating with, with places that have facilities for dumping. Correct. So then we can do well, a partnership. And my understanding is that the agency doesn't coordinate that we just send them off. the participants have to do that on their, their own. own. Okay, okay. And then the other thing in looking at temporary, um, what is the time frame? What is considered temporary? That's a great shelter? question. Uh, I don't have a good answer for you on no. what is temporary. The idea is, and this is part of what the systems capacity team is doing uh -huh. to try and find what is the most viable option? How fast can we move people Mm -hmm. out of a potential safe lot and into housing or other type of bridge housing. So for example, we are looking at things like master leasing and uh, locally funded mm -hmm. vouchers. We are, we are trying to explore the different gamut of opportunities uh, for housing. Mm -hmm. But okay. I'm sorry, I don't have a really good answer on what temporary means. Yeah, because again, it's when people are, are looking for a permanent solution right. or when you are in a situation where you are experiencing homeless, it takes, even when you have a, like a financial setback, it takes months and in right. some cases years to well, get I, back on your feet and build that capacity to be financially independent. I can address, I, what I do know, what I do know is that, and, and Joseph can, can speak to this as well, currently people in navigation mm -hmm. on average are taking four months, three to four months okay. to get into into their own permanent housing situation. So I, I don't know if that would be, that would correlate or that would, that would reflect this, the potential safe lot model, but we do have that data. We know okay. that it's taking three to four months okay. to get somebody who goes through navigation and into housing. Okay, so we would really like, to, so the safe lots then, if it could kind of mirror what, um, what the trends are being what the trends are, are being done. And, um, and thank you all so much for putting this together. Um, you know, one of the things, and I hear comments all the time that people aren't treated with dignity or respect, no matter what you're experiencing. I mean, we, a lot of us are one paycheck away from 
being homeless, experiencing right. homeless ourselves. So it's, it's really essential that we are treating our residents with um, and our constituents, our neighbors, with dignity and respect and finding options that will yeah. will preserve that humanity. And as a, as um, a, I appreciate that. And you know, just having taught in um, Title I schools my entire 25 year career, um, I've, I've had students who've lived in their cars well, and yeah. trying to, to create that stable stabilization for, for our kids and their families as well. So, uh, so thank you yeah. for the work you've done. Well, as a Habitat homeowner, I'm grateful for the city for the mm -hmm. work that you all have done as well and, and the city has done. I mean, that finding affordable housing in Longmont is, as Kathy mentioned, is not easy. Mm -hmm. no. Council Member Waters. Thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Alberto, I, I agree with um, the comment that this is real helpful. Uh, and so, and just on the follow on to this, mm -hmm. you made reference to, oh, just, just for my own clarity, uh, Hope's going to move forward with their with their program. Correct. Right. That is correct. As we continue to learn, right. do our own research, and you made reference to what we want to learn from the the Hope program. Mm -hmm. um, it would be really helpful to me mm -hmm. to know what is it we want to learn. What okay. are the specific questions uh, that we would like to have answered, uh, or as close to answered as we can as they move forward. Um, and I'll come back to what, you know, some of those, uh, why I think it's going to be clear, because, well, maybe I'll just go now, go there now. Mm -hmm. There are some aspects, I, I, I admire what, what Joseph and Hope is attempting to do here, but this gets framed as a pilot, and I'm going to sound, you know, I'll be accused of, of business speak here, and, um, but, I, but I have to say, a pilot program with no end is not a pilot program, but that this one has no ending. A, pro, a pilot program without a, either a clear theory of action or a, a model, evidence-based model that we're going to test with the questions that we want to answer with the test, does it, it's a, an experiment, which I think is fair, but I think we ought to be explicit whether we're conducting an experiment or a pilot program. Because if it's a pilot program, words like what somebody may do or could do aren't very helpful if you're trying to learn something from it or we're trying to learn something mm -hmm. from it. So that's the reason for me to be explicit on what we want to learn. Because okay. when it's somebody says somebody may do something, it's like, well, or could do something, or there's no, we don't, there is no end on this. It's like, well, what are you, you going to learn from that? So I think being explicit is going to be important. Okay. Tell me about costs. Um, mm -hmm. What I see here in, uh, on, the, on slide 8 of 13 rolls up to $611,000. Is that the cost to do two uh, safe lots? in the HOPE program of seven units, seven vehicles each? No, sir, that is the cost for an RV lot. So they're separated into <coughs> RV and vehicles. Um, and the, the RVs... Um, so we're taking <coughs> RVs off the board. Right, for, the, for HOPE's purposes. So it's the 104,000 for, for seven... Is that for one lot or two lots? Joseph, I'll let you... Thank you, uh, Councilman Waters. That's a good question. So my estimates were simply based on vehicles. The 30000 is a one-time investment for a uh, portable restroom trailer. Then it's just maintenance. The primary cost is simply security. And the five to seven vehicles is only for our startup. Uh, that will really be based on the capacity of the lot because uh, one security person can handle up to 20 vehicles in other models we've seen. Uh, I'd also like to mention that the RV startup costs um, there is no current model that is city funding that has that level of, um, uh, of services for larvae lots. That would be probably the luxury version of the country. It would be amazing, don't get me wrong, <laughs> if the city wants to invest in that. But um, a lot of city lots are, are so much more uh, simple um, in nature. So in the materials, I thought you were raising the funds to do that. As opposed We're to the not city quite investment. there. No, I, I'm, I'm going to be raising the funds for the... Um, Hundred and four thousand dollars. That's what. That's what I. That's that's, what I meant. that's what our funding campaign is going to be starting um, next month. So, uh, and that that will be for an, for an entire year. Um, but is that for is that for one or for two? Because you because it looks like you're going to test lots of five to seven units in two different locations. Correct. So, the dream vision for me is to have two two different lots 
for two different clientele, adult individuals, families and children, would be ideal. However, if I am only able to do one lot, uh, I will look at current, I hate to use the word demand, but th there's, most of the folks I'm running into are right now adult individuals because that's who we serve, but I know there is a large component of families. So um, I I'd love to be able to serve both in this, in this initial setup. And the, and the priority in this case would be the families or the individuals? If you could only do one. If I can only do one, I'm gonna look at uh, the largest capacity that I, that I can initially run into. Which but I mean, it would be the priority be families or individuals? If you can only do one, right. you're, gonna, you're gonna separate families from individuals. If you can only do one, which is your priority? That I don't have the answer to yet, simply because uh, I'm still gathering family data and I don't have all that yet. I, I know there's a large individual capacity that needs to be helped right now. Um, and I know, there's d I know there's demand for families too. So I, c I can't answer that yet, simply because I don't have all the data yet on the families right. to yet. Um, so it, so it, if you do only one, the, your estimate is the 104,000. Correct. It's going to, at this point, that cost will be uh, yeah, the same. Four. Yeah, that'll be the same because I can have security personnel going in between both lots. So, so whether it's one or two, you're, es you're envisioning the same cost? Or It'll be a little higher because I'll need either one more restroom. The restroom, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so you've got actually the probably, 30 th probably 34 of the 104 you'd have to duplicate or replicate in, in, molten, in both places, and then you could share security personnel, it looks like. Correct, and a part of our faith community and some of our churches have been really great in speaking with them, like the Heart of Longmont was here uh, today, on Flintsler. Um, some of our church facilities that do have showers are very interested in this project so as well. So it might take that, might yeah, solve so that problem. That's what I'm still trying to figure out, right. is what facility would be best. All first. right, thank you. So, Alberto, I'm gonna come back to you. Well, can I just add about the experiment and plan? So, Joseph didn't mention this, but he and I have emailed back and forth, and there is plans to do it. Um, a six month, a three three months, six month. Can you? So, for us, it's initially we're going to look at this on a three month basis. When you talk about pilot, um, the summer months are the easiest, obviously, for for a lot of reasons. So, we're gonna look at it for the three months in the summer initially, just from a logistics planning standpoint. Uh, how our faith partners are feeling about the program. Uh, we'll talk to our participants, how they're feeling about it, and adjust as needed. Um, and, and to your point, Councilman Waters, this uh, will certainly last longer than a pilot. I mean, these models are very successful. I just think, yeah. I think our language is important, right. and, and I think experimenting is okay. <laughs> I think it's actually that's what you do before you do a pilot. So I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. I just. I just think we ought to, if we could ever get together on what these things mean, it would, for me, it would expedite the, you know, the discussions and the thinking. Um, are we, so maybe either for Joseph or for how we're thinking about this, are there fees? Are we think, are we envisioning fees uh, to be associated with a lot? So Council on the Waters and members of Council, we haven't discussed that. So again, that's, that's part of what we were asking for tonight is direction. Uh, as a research team, we have not discussed fees, but we will now go back and discuss fees and, and, and try and find models that have fees. For whatever it's worth, I assume in, our, in the intake process, there is some income data that we collect. For, for, for navigation services or yes, you yes. Know, financial status. Right. So I assume we could, I don't, means testing is probably a stronger statement than it needs to be, that, but there's some, some approach to establishing ability. And it would seem to me that if, we, if there is no fee, this is a ph philosophical statement and maybe a question. Um, it just, you know, my, the mindset is services for which people pay nothing, they value in, in ways that might reflect what that transaction is. I just think if we're going to do this, even if it, there's some dignity in, even if it's 50 cents a night, that there's some fee that goes along with this, just, as, just from a, a philosophical perspective. So for whatever it's worth, um, it's, you know, I'm just one person talking. I mean, I'll make my last statement here and then, and then Joseph can jump back in. When you, if, we're gonna, if you're gonna come back to us with something, it would be helpful for me, I don't know about others, um, to have it, to, it, because, right, here's a problem statement. Because of X, we are going to do Y, right? And here's how we'll know if we're successful. 
And that would all start with what, if the goal is to transition participants in the safe lot to transitional housing, uh, then, then, there, then there ought to be some performance, some numbers in there, right? Indicator. Well, no, we're successful when we've trans, trans for, or con, I don't know, what's the right term? We've helped. We've housed. You know, uh, we've, 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 we've helped all or some percentage of the participants in the safe lot transition to, to transitional housing, right? Mm -hmm. However we're going to label that. That we have some kind of structure like that, and then you can cite the evidence, or if it's, there's no evidence and it's just a theory of action, what that is. But be explicit on it mm -hmm. so, so we, it takes mystery out of things. Mm -hmm. And you can learn as you go along and make adjustments. Mm -hmm. But I think we ought to be clear on the front end why we're doing it, what we're going to do, and how we're, how we're going to know if we're successful. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I just want to make sure that we are not making um, lifestyle choices on behalf of people who don't need lifestyle choices made for them. Um, and this is not to attack what's being done at all here. But we did have some people speak very mm -hmm. coherently about the fact that they have made their lifestyle choice and they are fine living in RVs and it would be better if the city adapted in such a way that the RV population and the property owning population just could coexist together a little better than they do. <laughs> We're not supposed to clap, but I'm glad you like the way I said it. Um, and so I do think that one, um, you know, there's a difference between living in a car where you don't have a bathroom and you don't have a kitchen and you really don't have much agency. If you're living in a car, you know you're on your way to something better if you can possibly get there. On the other hand, living in an RV is a, a lifestyle that you can, cha can choose and have agency about living that way. And you just need to live in a community that, that um, is adapted to it in a reasonable way. And it's also the biggest population, people living in well-maintained RVs was the biggest population that you've counted so far. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put out that we need to um, count when we're counting as, as to whether people um, want to change their living situation or just want it to work a little bit better um, and uh, to acknowledge that um, adapting to the community's needs is part of the RV safe lot uh, program. So, you know, I, I, I think Doll over here doesn't want to be yanked out of her uh, RV and in, it, it's a very nice one and she's proud of it and she doesn't want to change that for an apartment. And I think it's especially since um, we do have a place, she can drive over to the uh, fairgrounds and pay $5 or what $10 or whatever it is and do her thing over there um, and then come back and park legally uh, even today. But if she could park a little out of the way so that, you know, somebody's some parent with kids didn't get scared of her, even though she doesn't look very scary to me, um, that that would be an upgrade for the whole city. So I just want to make sure that as you go forward, you're collecting that kind of information from people that you speak to and um, that the solution that you come up with takes all that into account. You actually gave us a, a question we need to add because um, I don't want the data to be misleading in that operating means that they're fully operating. Operating can mean that they can move. Uh -huh. It may not mean that they're not leaking and other issues. Mm -hmm. And so I just leaned over to Eliberto and said we need to ask another question on that. Is it operating? Can it move? And then is it fully functioning? Yes. Because I don't think we're capturing that data because that tends to be it's the where it's not fully functioning and we get 
gray water and other issues, wastewater on the street that we tend to deal with in neighborhoods. So we actually need to add another question to the survey, and that's part of the um, intuitive piece of this. Well, and there's, yeah, there's probably, I mean, fully operational means you have at least heat, that it doesn't leak waste, right. and that it, you can move it from one place to the other if you don't have uh, uh, a, a, a clean out facility right where you're parking. So there's at least three questions, I think. Um, and maybe we could ask for some uh, advice for the people who have experience with the lifestyle uh, mm -hmm. as to what the um, criterion ought to be because I bet they know. So thank you. Yes. Councilmember Peck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I would like to just respond to a couple things that Councilman Waters said uh, about the pilot program. I agree that we need uh, targets, data, et cetera, on a pilot program, but listening to the coordinated entry and the length of time it takes to actually transition, I think it would be very difficult to set a time on uh, a pilot program to begin with. Because if it takes four months to a year to transition into housing, and the pilot program only goes for nine months, it, it kind of, I think we should have it as an experiment to begin with so that we aren't, we're still learning. So, um, and as far as people paying for the lot, I think that this is going to be a nonprofit more than likely, which means that we would probably accept donations rather than charging a fee. So I'm not sure that we can do that under a nonprofit. The other thought to think about is that if these are operational vehicles and people are working, regardless of whether they're cars or RVs, chances are you can shut this down during the day. Because they would be driving, if that is their main vehicle, they'll be driving it to work, dropping their kids off if it's family, and they won't have a need for one during, during the day unless it's some kind of an emergency. So those are just things to think about as we go forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I, to address Councilwoman Martin's uh, suggestions, if, if, this is a, if this is a whole different conversation, if the city's going to get into sponsoring a permanent livable RV lot, and that is the luxury lot with, uh, and, and I don't think we're, from what I have heard and what we were discussing, that is not where we were gonna go with trying to be a part of coordinated entry. But that's just my opinion, to have permanent living spaces, such as it would be like a trailer park, but with RVs. Uh, I don't think the city at this point has had that discussion as to whether we wanna go into that or not. These are two different discussions. Thank you. Councilmember Christensen. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, in regard to what um, both Councilwoman Peck and uh, Councilwoman Martin said, um, concerning RVs, I think maybe we should ask uh, people coming into this, if we do uh, move forward eventually and have an RV situation. The reason RVs can't um, goes be in a mobile home park is that RVs are not legally supposed to be occupied uh, all year round. They're not um, designed to be lived in year round, but people do. So I think um, one thing I would like to see asked is if people would like the choice of being able to be, in, uh, instead of uh, transitioned into an apartment, if they would like to be transmissioned into a uh, mobile home. Because that is a, that would give them a lot more options. They could go live at a mobile home park if they so choose. Um, there are a number of things that are um, not up to code that I, I don't know that we can ever make it uh, like a legal permanent RV lot because it's simply, not supposed to be, they're, no, they're just not supposed to be lived in uh, according to code all across the United States is my understanding from my, my research. Um, so anyway, 
uh, if if uh, people wanted to transition into something that would be a little more livable, but would still allow them the freedom of uh, moving around, I think that could be a good choice too. You know, to to help help them um, have more agency and still live the kind of life they want to live, but also uh, give them a better living situation that's a little safer. Council Member Waters. Uh, my, my question about fees really wasn't so much about the, what Hope's doing, and I don't know what Hope can or can't do with collecting fees. I was more interested in what we're thinking about, right, if we're going to do something with the city. Uh, so uh, I guess a question to the city attorney if we can, if we try, if we can charge fees for camping, we can charge fees for uh, uh, parks and rec use. We can charge fees for a lot of things. We could charge fees, I would assume, if we wanted to, uh, for somebody to participate. Excuse me, to participate in a in a safe lot. Is that a fair assumption? Or what would ex maybe then you'll, then you'll get to answer the next question. What would exclude safe lots if you said no? Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney, the fees that you uh, listed are usually for a use of a city service or property. Wouldn't this be the use of city, if it's a city, well, I'm talking about a city safe lot. Oh, for a city not, safe not, lot? Not the, not the whole project. One would think that you could probably charge fees on those. Yeah, and I'm not, for, talk, for I'm not talking about trying to make money on this. I'm just saying that uh, there's, something, there's something about that and I just think that ought to be part of you know when you bring it back that that'll be a question I'll have and we can talk about it then but I wasn't thinking about it so much for hope they'll do whatever they want to do with with that um, I do think I'll just for me if we were to go in the direction of the of an RV park that would be have more permanence to it right this is not about transitioning obviously there are different expenses that were going to occur and I would I would I wouldn't while I might support the idea I wouldn't support it without expecting if people are going to participate there is a fee that they pay not just for for dumping but um, I mean there's a public investment in creating a space and that participants just like they would in a campground um, there'd be some probably nominal fee that would go along with that if it's a city operation so councilman waters uh, my understanding from our conversations at the research is that I think there's an ordinance that bans RV parks in the city? Is that correct, Joni? Currently, our zoning code doesn't have any allowances for allowing RV right. parks, so that's simply a code change that council would direct All right. to do I, so. I wasn't, or I wasn't advocating when, when, when I wasn't advocating going in that direction. I was just suggesting right. that if we're going to do it, I'm going to come back to the fee discussion if, we, if that were to be a direction. Okay. Okay, I haven't been able yet to chime in, so I just thought I'd uh, give a couple of thoughts. Um, obviously, as we see the cost breakdown, the difference between Hope's estimates and, and the estimates based off of an RV safe lot from the city, uh, one concept is that the, their permanent infrastructure improvements, generally speaking, I assume so for a $275,000 bathroom facility would be more of a permanent structure than a temporary structure. Um, and I did, when I went to school out in California, I had friends that went to school with me who lived in RV parks out there. And so I, I take it that's obviously, I don't know what the ownership structure of those places were, but I obviously uh, imagine they paid a fee to live in those RV parks. And uh, they seemed like perfectly decent places to live as far as if you decided that's what your, uh, you know, preferable style of living was and these people you know, the, I went to a fairly expensive private school and these folks that were going to the same private school with me lived in RV parks so I mean it makes no uh, real determination on where you're going to school what you're doing that's just how you choose to live and and your, your mode and so if it's really just a change of code at the city level it's something we really need to consider because uh, obviously not everyone's looking for transitional you know services into permanent dwelling units of uh, you know brick and mortar um, if you will and so I, I really do hope we we consider that going forward uh, not just the safe lots for cars because obviously if you're living in a car that seems to be a much more uh, necessity for transitional services because folks are not generally choosing to live in cars out of lifestyle choice versus an RV which is a completely different different style and I do agree with the statements are uh, previously made about 
mobile versus fully functional as far as RVs are, are considered. Um, and I'm sure there are folks in RVs that are looking for transitional services as well. So I think we, we do need to consider the, the full gamut uh, here as we, as we move forward um, to really address also the problems or some of the concerns from our residents who are worried about you know the uh, folks that are, are in front of their homes or in their neighborhoods and uh, and so if we can provide safe places for both folks that want to make that lifestyle choice or folks that need a transitional service I think uh, you know it just does a full service for both the folks in the RVs and the vehicles as well as our folks that are, are you know living in homes where these tend to congregate if you will um, as such, I, I don't really see any more comments. I thank you so much, Eliberto, and the, and the full task force for bringing your, your report to us. And we look forward to, because uh, as, as was mentioned, not the final report, and, and seeing some of the other uh, proposals brought forward to the, the council. Mm -hmm. So as such, we'll move along with to the 2020 legislative bills recommended for city council position uh, with Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager Sandy Cedar. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager, and I have four bills for your consideration today, um, two of them regarding mobile home parks, so uh, sort of part of the conversation. So the first one is House Bill 20-1017, um, concerning treatment of individuals with substance use disorders who come into contact with the criminal justice system. So this bill is well-meaning. It provides safe spaces for people to be able to bring um, drugs and be able to get help, but it mandates it in a way that is contrary to the way that we are doing it with our angel and network today. This also creates an unfunded mandate. And so even though we appreciate what they're trying to do with this bill and staff is working with the um, bill sponsors, they, the wording has not yet changed. And so at this point, the staff recommends that city council opposes House Bill 20-1017. House Bill 20-1196 concerning updates to the laws governing mobile home parks. So this bill defines new terms for the purpose of the mobile home park um, and the dispute resolution. Basically it strengthens the rights of residents in mobile home parks and because this is important, this uh, issue of housing and their rights are important to the city council, staff recommends the city council supports 1196. House Bill 20-1201 is another uh, mobile home park bill and basically provides the homeowners in a mobile park the opportunity to purchase the park under specified circumstances. It lays out when notice needs to be given to those residents and how that might be conducted. Um, again, this strengthens the rights of the mobile home park owners. Um, and so city staff recommends that city council supports 1201. I should note that both 1201 and 1196 are up in committee tomorrow. So if the, com if the council does decide that they would like to support these bills, um, I have some contact information with Boulder County if you're interested in going down and being part of the, the conversation and the bill and you know signing piece, so um, bill committee. The last one, House Bill 20-1294 concerning replacing the term illegal alien with undocumented immigrant as it relates to public contracts for services. This does exactly uh, what you have already done and removes the requirement for illegal alien certification but instead replaces it with undocumented um, immigrant. So of course we would rather have a full repeal, but this is way better than nothing. So we would suggest that you support House Bill 20-1294. This is a study session, so I might remind the council that if you'd like to take positions on these bills, your first motion needs to be sus to suspend the rules of procedure to do so, and then to take your positions. Council Member Martin. Council Member Martin. Oh, uh, I move to suspend the rules. And then uh, I move that the count. Okay. Oh, do we need to? Well, we'll take we'll take that vote. For, I was just looking to see if anybody had any yeah. objections. No. Uh, uh, we'll take the vote. Uh, any uh, uh, the vote on the motion? Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. The motion carries unanimously, six to zero. Um, and then I move that we the council accept um, Ms. Cedar's recommendations as written. Second. For all yeah. four, yeah. Thank you. Any debate? Second. Seeing no debate, uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries six to zero with Mayor Bagley absent. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in going to the committee hearing tomorrow, just let me know after the meeting. 
All right, uh, now we're on to mayor and council comments. Council Member Christensen. Uh, I forgot earlier to mention this, but um, the city staff uh, wrote a very, very, I thought a very good letter, a very compassionate and sensible letter about the problem of meth, um, uh, meth problems and classifying everything as a one size takes all. Um, I, uh, I wanted to congratulate them for doing that. I thought it was a terrific thing to gather a whole group of people from staff to, s to try to explain how this sort of one size fits all does not fit anybody and the expense it causes and it's horrific for the Longmont Housing Authority but it's also for, well, and everybody. Um, so I, I would like to um, at least personally get some follow up on that, what, what comes of that. I think we'd all appreciate it though. Thank you. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I was going to give kudos to Mayor Bagley. I will anyway, but it's too bad he's not here. Um, this Friday on the 21st, uh, a group of people are going to Fort Worth uh, to talk to BNSF executives about our peak service and the corridor, getting modeling and uh, so hopefully some costs for the entire corridor. Mayor Bagley is going and our chief transportation engineer, uh, Tyler Stamey is going, which I'm very happy that they're going to bring back that data so that we can move forward on this project. Um, and I'm, I have to say that Tyler is the only engineer that is actually going. <laughs> and this is a modeling project. Uh, a lot of people are going just to uh, give their input, but we really needed an engineer and I'm proud that Tyler is going because he's, uh, he's great. So I look forward personally to having that data brought back to council and uh, hopefully we can move on with this project. Seeing no other comments, city manager. No comments, Mayor Council. Thank you, city attorney. No comments, Mayor Bertham. I move adjournment. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We are adjourned.